We're going to look at inverse trigonometric functions. But before you can engage with inverse trigonometric functions, you must know what an inverse function is and what a trigonometric function is. So make sure you're familiar with those. Then we can look at the inverse trigonometric functions. Now, I've got the sketch of sine of x there. Hopefully you remember that if I want an inverse function, my original function has to be 1 to 1. Now, sine of x is definitely not 1 to 1. I can pick many y values and notice there are multiple x values mapped onto them. It's actually an infinite because this wave just keeps carrying on. So for any of those y values between minus 1 and 1, there's an infinite number of x values mapped onto it. So sine of x as it stands does not have an inverse function because it's not 1 to 1. So what we're going to do, we want the inverse of a sine function. So I'm going to limit the domain of sine. I'm going to cut sine off between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. I'm going to cut it off and say I'm only looking at that portion of the sine function. Because if I look at the y values, the x values, just between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, then I've got a 1 to 1 function. So let's zoom in. This is what it looks like then. I've got a 1 to 1 function. Fluctuates between minus 1 and 1. It doesn't fluctuate. It just goes from minus 1 to 1, and that's the shape it takes on. Now, if I've got this sine function with a limited domain, now I can find the inverse function. And inverse functions are handy, and that's why we require to look at this. So I'm defining my inverse function sine. Now, the notation as it stands there, sine, that's not an exponent of minus 1. That is the notation for inverse. But another notation, we can call it arc sine of x. So if you do not like the what looks like an exponent minus 1, but that inverse notation, you can call it arc sine. And I will use them interchangeably. So the inverse of sine of x is y, if and only if sine of y is equal to x, because that's how we define the inverse function. So in my inverse function, we now will have the y values between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So let's see what that inverse function is going to look like. We want to, the sine function, symmetric around the line y equal to x. We know my sine function was between minus 1 and 1. So my x values went between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. My y values between minus 1 and 1. So with my inverse function, my y values go, now go between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 where x goes between minus 1 and 1. So my x values are going to be, be between minus 1 and 1. My y values between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Right, my original function cuts both at the origin. So I'm going to have that function there. And now you must just use your visualization skills to draw the mirror image of this one. And it will look something like this. There we go. And that is arc sine of x. So arc sine of x is then a one-to-one -one function because the original function I had, I limited to a one-to-one -one function. And that's how we define arc sine of x. But now let's just take a look at how we use it. What do we do with it? If I've got sine of pi over 4, you should know that sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. Now what that tells me is that arc sine of root 2 over 2 must give me pi over 4. So we're very happy with that. Now sine of th th 3 pi over 2 is minus 1. But I can't take arc sine of 3 pi over 2 because 3 pi over 2 is not in the domain of sine when I limit the domain to a 1 to 1 function. So arc sine of 3 pi over 2, now arc sine of minus 1, will actually take me back to minus pi over 2. So let's see why. I'm going to back to the previous screen. We're looking at sine of 3 pi over 2. Here at 3 pi over 2, sine of 3 pi over 2 is minus 1. But 3 pi over 2 is not in the domain where I chopped it off. So it's not going to be part of arc sine. Only this part is part. So my function go looks for another place where I've got minus 1 and the x value. So we know that 
sine of minus pi over 2 gives me minus 1. So arc sine of minus 1 gives me minus pi over 2 and not 3 pi over 2. So watch that you do not swap around sine and arc sine too liberally because whatever comes out here has to be in the range of my arc function. All right, so arc cos. Now we know the story. What we want to do, we want to limit the domain because arc cos also has a domain of all real numbers. It's not one to one. I want to limit that domain. So where am I going to limit it? I'm going to cut it off there and there. So between zero and pi. So when I cut it off between zero and pi, this is what I've got. Where I'm at one there and at minus one over here. So this is the function I have. So I've now limited the domain of cos of x so that I can define cos inverse. So cos inverse of x, my y values go between naught and pi. And my x values go between minus 1 and 1. So if I had to sketch that inverse cos function or arc cos function, we know we're going to go between minus 1 and 1 and 0 and pi. And if we draw a line symmetric around the line y equal to x, we're going to get a function that goes like this. What happens? Here, it cuts the x-axis at pi over 2, so we're going to cut the y-axis at pi over 2. It starts here, where x is 0 and y is 1. So here we've got where x is 1 and y is 0. And there we go. That is the arc cos function. All right, the arc tan function. Now, tan, also not a one-to-one -one function, so we want to chop it off. A very obvious place to chop it off is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we're going to look at that. Now, notice minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 are not included in my limited domain because they're not included in the original domain. Tan is undefined at those two values. So what do I do? I'm only looking at one of them, and these keep going on. I've got asymptotes over there. I define my inverse function, arc tan of x is equal to y, if and only if tan of y is equal to x. Now y is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. What is my domain going to be of this inverse function? Well, what was the range of my 1 to 1 function? My y values were all real numbers. So now x is going to be all real numbers. So what we're going to get is we're going to get a function that has asymptotes pi over 2, y equal to pi over 2, and y equal to minus pi over 2. It's going to cut here at 0, and what we're going to have is a function that goes like this. So it looks a little bit different. Now, yet again, when we start looking at differentiation and integration, this function is going to come up again. So it's important to know what octan of x looks like. So the last one we're going to look at is sec. I'm not going to go through it with too much detail. Sec and cosec are a little bit complicated because we've got to limit the domain so that we've got a one-to-one -one function. So I can't take one of the loops. So I'm going to take part of one loop and part of the other. So I'm going to take this part of this loop and the part of this loop over here. All right, now it's very specifically chosen. There's some alternatives too, but we'll see when we start differentiating the inverse trig functions why we chose it that way. When we choose that, those are the portions we choose. We define arc sec, and we have, if we have to sketch arc sec, it's going to look like this. It's going to have these asymptotes that we have here at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And here at pi, some things are going to happen. We're going to have 1 and minus 1. All right, so here we go. Between 0 and pi over 2, for this portion, my graph is going to look like this. That's the mirror image. And then for this portion over here, my graph goes in this direction. There we go. So that is y equal to arc sine 
of x, arcsec of x. All right, so you get the idea of how the inverse trig functions are defined. I've summarized them all here. Each inverse trig function, their domains and their ranges. So make sure you're familiar with what they look like and make sure that you remember that we have to limit the domain of the original sine cos tan, the original trigonometric functions, before we can define the inverse trigonometric functions.